Hello everyone. How is everyone doing today? I hope everyone is doing fine. And thank you for being here with us on second week of VESA program. We'll discuss lots of interesting stuff today also. So if you are here first time, uh, thank you for joining us for the first time. If you're second time, I appreciate your continued support to our program and hope we are making your life a little better in terms of learning AWS, understanding solution architecting, and at least motivating you to achieve better and make your tomorrow better than today. So thank you everyone. And I will quickly will introduce who is with me today. So I'm having Michelle with me today. Then I have Jamila also helping us with chat and she would also be presenting. And then I have Abhijit also. Maybe he is camera shy today, but don't worry, he is there to help you out. So we will try our best to help you out. Hey, Abhijit. So we will discuss lots of interesting stuff. And in between, if there are any questions, any doubts, any confusions, let us know. We would happy to help you out in all the ways we can. We are running this on a voluntary basis, so we have limited bandwidth, but we are trying our best to reach out to as many people as we can who ask questions or who ask for support. So we would try to support as much as we can. Okay, good. Thank you. Now uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, others to just comment that which city you are joining from. Just like to get us started. Maybe we are people are still joining in. So let's give two more minutes. Let's leverage that which city you are joining from. I'm seeing people from London. A lot of people from second in second by Singapore. Wow, that should be so so early, isn't it? Thank you so much. And then reading Bangalore, Edinburgh. Rajkot, Pune, Kerala, Kolkata, Singapore. Yeah, I'm making my list of the cities to visit. So, so that gives me inspiration that what all cities I haven't been. So that's that's a good thing. Dubai I have been, Bangalore I have been. I lived there both the places. Mumbai obviously, Texas. Now nice. that's a different thing. I have to go there. All right, thank you. So feel free to ask questions. We would try our best to answer as much as we can, and I'll quickly get started. I'll introduce what is going to happen today. I'll talk about containers. Obviously, container is a very big topic. I'll try to cover the basics, not in terms of what container is, but I'll talk in terms of what AWS services can help you in running container. Probably I'll show you some demo. Then Jamila will help us with some of the behavioral part. She is an avid reader and she would give us some recommendation about the books which could help you in growing. Then we would have James also joining us in a bit who would also continue the serverless track which he started. Serverless track would be there for till the eight weeks. So you would we will be going deep dive and understand lots of different component as we speak. We got your input last time that hey, a lot of people wanted to work on networking side or wanted to understand networking. So we are trying to figure out how we could facilitate that discussion. Maybe a separate a separate topic or maybe a separate session we would dedicate for networking. And if there are any other topic which you feel daunted with or anything confuses you in AWS, let us know. And if we have expertise, we would try to explain those topics also to you. So thank you for sharing those information and keep your questions coming. Abhijit and Michelle are there. Jamila is also answering the question and we will have more people joining in. So feel free to ask questions. OK, so I'll, I'll switch off cameras and then I let you focus on the content and I'll be sharing, showing you some more details as we move forward. So thanks, everyone. Let me get started without camera and let you focus on the content part of this so that you could understand better what is all going to be there. Networking is the most confusing part. I understand Santosh. I will try my best to find out how we could help you there. So we will see how we could help you there. So let's move forward. Now what I'm going to explain you today is a little bit on the container side that how actually containers work and what component in AWS can help you in achieving those things. So I'll talk about some services in AWS, which is ECR, ECS, EKS and Fargate. Don't get confused about the wording. I'll try my best to explain you when to use which one and which one is good, which one has some challenges or these type of stuff. So we'll discuss it. But if you know me, I, I want to start technology not from your technology perspective. I want to understand things from real day to day life concept because technology is not coming from space. It is being inspired by the things which we see all in day to day life. So let's start with containers too. Containers are all not different. 
what hopefully you are seeing on the screen right now is how shipping used to happen before actual containers came into existence. Now, obviously, these are grayscale pictures, very old, I could understand it. And that is how our shipping industry used to work. There were a lot of manpower, not efficiency. There were lots of challenges in, in maintaining these type of ports and then loading ships, unloading ships. A lot of manpower was required. It could be prone to accident. You were not utilizing things at maximum capacity. So what we are going to do here, that let's try to solve that problem. So not me, but people solve these problem. The people in container industry or shipping industry, they started solving this problem. They have created this intermodal shipping container. They realize that, that is a, there is a need to standardize the thing. We ship different stuff, I agree, but we need to ensure that we want to put things in a standard format. So a standard container with a fixed dimension, with a fixed weight capacity, with a fixed size, with the fixed type of uh, capacity and the, the different aspect of it would make everyone's life is easier. So whatever you want to ship, push everything into container and through that container, you could ship it anywhere. If I give you my example, when I was shifting from Dubai to London, I was given an option by a courier company that, hey, if you have a lot of stuff, why don't you book a container? We'll get all your stuff inside that container, ship it to you. It would come to your home, you would unload it, and then you would be good to go. But I I didn't want to carry that much stuff. So that's why I said, no, it's not required. Then they gave me another option that instead of getting the whole, whole container, you could book half of the container and we would charge you only for that. And that's how my stuff could come to UK. So that was interesting stuff. And that similar approach we follow here into computing also. So we'll discuss those things also as we move forward. Now, what the standardization helps you in? Once you have standardized your concept or container sizes, then the benefit here is that you could start building your industry around it. You always know what is the size of the container would be. So you could build your crane facilities around it. You could create storage facilities around it. You know how much weight it would carry. So you could design your weighing system accordingly. Then if you have to transport it after it has been loaded or unloaded, that time we may want to utilize trains or trucks or any other type of things. And they can all work together because everything is standard format. Everyone knows when I'm talking about a full container, what is the size? What is the dimension? How much maximum weight it may have? So it makes life easier for everyone. That's how containers standardize the whole shipping industry. And today you talk about everything is happening through shipping industry and everything happens through that so that you should not be able to go ahead and you should be able to ensure all these components as it moves forward. All right. Hopefully everyone is following along and understanding. And if there are any questions, let me know and I would be happy to answer or our team could answer it as we move forward, right? So hopefully this is clear. Now let's talk about how the application without containers run in AWS, and then we'll see how containers standardize our approach. So let me now move forward to approach of running application without containers. And I would then see how we could run things with containers. So let's see what the challenges are. Now, if I do not have containerized approach, now probably you all know that there are not a single component nowadays which is making up application. We are all talking about microservice architectures. So there is maybe a static website hosted, then there may be a user database hosted for the same application. Maybe there would be something like queue, maybe analytical database is there, maybe you have API endpoint, and they may be running their own runtime environment and they all together make up my application. So we have multiple types of stacks running and these services and app interact appropriately, yes, but then I have to maintain the same environment in my development machine, in my QA server, if I am running it on a custom data center, if I have maintained a disaster recovery site, or if I have a public cloud, or if I have a production cluster, all the places I have to keep on maintaining same version of Nginx, same version of Java. If I update one, I have to update another. I have to ensure the dependencies are taken care. I have to ensure there are no complicated configuration inside it. So that makes my life much, much complicated. And this is what is referred as sometime called metrics from hell. 
and i maintained these type of tables when i worked in qa we had different environments and we had to maintain that hey what are the type of databases we are using which version of patch we have what is my website is my code version on that what type of queuing mechanism and what patch level it is so it has become very complicated over long run to ensure that all these components are there and they are working together so that is complicated thing and that's what we want to solve here as we move forward okay hopefully everyone is following along so you are clear with the problem and let's see how now containers can solve this particular problem so let me get started and talk about that so this is a little longer definition which i have still want to read from the slide that modeled on the success of shipping container an application container is designed to contain a complete deployment unit for an application to allow for automation version tracking and rapid deployment so what we are doing here we are taking a container and in that container as it is a standard size we know how much is the capacity of it and all these things so a physical container similar to virtual containers here and in that we provide a standard way of packaging our application so we take a container and in that container we start adding component so obviously i need to run my application so i would package my application in a container but that would be a challenge that because my application would require dependency so why don't i put my dependency also within the container so that is another thing so i have a layered approach i have my application it requires some dependencies maybe some libraries maybe some of the script something whatever i could put it into my dependency and then it may require a configuration setting also which could be little different for qa environment maybe little different for production but i could package it all together into a container so all my configurations can also be there and i don't want to put my operating system completely here what containers do they have hooks into operating system so whenever they have to make a call to operating system let's say they need a disk space they need a processing power they need a network connectivity so they do not have that logic written inside it they just leverage the operating system and through which they are able to run this so all these required component to run my application i would put inside the container and would start working from there so that is what a container is it contains your application it has your dependencies whatever you need and then you have configuration and hooks into operating system that's what we utilize it one container is a subset of microservice as the goal purpose or both are kind of similar right so microservice is what we may want to achieve right microservice i would say is my final outcome now how i run that microservice i may take bunch of ec2 and let them be managed as a microservice i may take multiple containers i may call my lambda function being backend for my microservice so microservice is a, a, a interaction point and the powering mechanism behind it could be ec2 could be a container could be a lambda function could be on prem server it could be anything so microservice is approach whereas these container ec2 are the mechanism to deliver that approach to you so it could be still your ec2 but still it could be a microservice so it depends but idea here is microservice gel well with container because microservices are smaller in sizes same way we want to keep containers also into smaller sizes so we could start them faster we could deploy them faster we could version them faster and remove them and add new container faster so they have good combination but i could do this without containers also why do we choose container over serverless when it comes to solutioning uh different reason see serverless is a nice thing and i'm not saying that serverless and containers are competing because there are services in container realm also who are serverless so serverless is a approach so serverless can be in container serverless can be in lambda function serverless can be in api gateway and it's a common misconception that people think serverless equal to lambda lambda equal to serverless i would say no serverless is approach and then s3 is serverless service kinesis is serverless service dynamo db is a serverless service so how we deliver it that's would depend on the service we are offering so even for containers we have serverless services and we'll discuss them as we move forward right okay now what are the advantages of container once you start utilizing these services first thing we still have virtual machine approach but virtual machine is little complicated in the sense it has its own operating system and it maintains that operating system so you have to keep on applying patches you have to keep on applying runtime environment on that and they have a bigger footprint 
means this virtual machine itself would require lot of cpu and memory because it is running the full copy of operating system so that's why you may have utilization of virtual machine higher whereas containers have smaller footprint it's like a person traveling with 10 suitcases is a virtual machine and a person is traveling only with a uh, hand luggage is your container so container can move faster containers can be created faster rather virtual machine takes time to boot and it has its own footprint it would require a lot of memory and cpu even to get started so that's how they may be a little different but yes question was containers only for linux i would say no it is most preferred but then there are solutions available on Windows also where you could have even on your laptop or desktop, you could run container on a Windows machine should not be a problem. That should not be a problem. So that's how all these things would be working. So this is my virtual machine. Now, good thing is once I have this thing packaged, I could move it from dev to test to production or here and there much easier because it is all standard size things which we are utilizing by which we are delivering all the services. So we all have seen the problem developer says hey it works best on my machine it is not working on your machine that is your machine's problem or qa tested it fine and then we have another machine on production and it doesn't work there and then operation team blames developer developer blames operating operation team that there is a version mismatch last time you did upgrade you didn't follow the same process in our production and that's why it is not working so that was a challenge and containers portable mechanism would allow you to move from dev to test test to prod without any issue should not be a problem at all so that is another benefit of containers another benefit we have is they are smaller they are greater efficiency and smooth scaling you could keep on adding more and more container remove them when you do not need it and it will boot very fast because it's not loot not loading the whole operating system image so it is much much faster to get started and once you are starting with agile or devops type of approach they follow very uh, logically into this space because you should be able to control them faster deploy them faster do version control on that deploy them through infrastructure as a code so all of these work well with devops type of approach so hopefully this thing is clear and let's go ahead and talk about that we can create container image that can these images be version control yes why not it can be you could put a version control on it and i'll show you some demo where you would be some different thing on how is container different from package software see package software is also in a way a container right it is still a container so if you are talking about application virtualization type of a feature it is still a type of container but the main way we deliver containers here is we mostly talk about docker based container but yes application virtualization again a container mechanism even if before these docker became popular there was jvm java virtual machine and still is there and it is still a way of containerization only thing is that docker made it very popular and everyone started talking about container the concepts was there from long time docker made it much practical much efficient and that's why docker equal to container container equal to docker that's how the people started learning and understanding the, about them but we will talk more on that that it is not just docker but something beyond it so docker docker is an open platform for developing shipping and running application so you should be able to go ahead and deploy and run these application if required so this is what a docker platform would do it is an engine that enable any payload to be encapsulated that is a keyword so we encapsulate the required things make it portable make it self-sufficient and run it as a container so that's how all these things would be working and that can be manipulated then using standard operations and run continuously on virtual or any hardware platform so that's the beauty you do not just need a virtual machine you may run it on cloud you may run it on production system on on-prem service or you may run it on a other cloud provider shouldn't be a problem so that's how docker made it popular now how containers actually run let me give you a little more idea and that will hopefully give you an idea containers share an operating system let me tell you what is mean by that what is orchestration we'll talk about that it is coming up Ghansham. hold on for that we'll talk about that now in a traditional approach even before virtual machine what we were doing we were taking physical server putting operating systems on top of it and then we installed applications on it now once this traditional approach was there we were not having the best utilization of hardware then came the hypervisor approach 
in hypervisor we were virtualizing the hardware so we created virtual cpu virtual ram virtual disk virtual network card and we presented those resources to our virtual machine and on that virtual machine then we started running application for up, up operating systems and that's how my hypervisor came into picture but the challenge here was i have to still maintain that operating system and it was eating up a lot of cpu and memory and it was taking time it was little clumsy because it has lots of component inside that container leverage the similar approach but in a different fashion you would still have a traditional operating system on your machine you do not have to pay extra to get that fancy hypervisor from vmware hyper v or oracle you still use standard operating systems and on the standard operating system what you could do you could run a container platform or you could install a container platform now the most common platform people talk about is docker but it is not the only one what you could have you could have decided that apart from docker maybe i want to run lxd that is another one and then we have rkt rocket people call it and that is also one of the container platform once you have deployed it now you have capability that you are able to run your containers on of, on top of it and this is what i mean by hooks in the operating system so once your container need disk access it needs a network card access it would be talking to this platform and that platform will claim that resource from operating system and present to the container if needed and every container is isolated they can talk to each other but if you want they would be just talking to themselves or to the host or someone else and they can be completely running in an isolated fashion without interfering with other with every container i could decide how much cpu memory disk i want to associate and i could run multiple containers on one hardware which means i would have higher density of running my applications on contain on the physical hardware so more container would be accommodated on to a hardware rather than less virtual machine and that's how containers actually run all right good containers is a vm internally uh, in a way yes prashant but i won't call it a full virtual machine because it is not having a operating system a virtual machine is accept, expected to have a operating system here we do not have operating system built into container but yes to understand it that's still okay so containers i sorry virtualization we was doing hardware virtualization containers i would say they are doing operating system virtualization and through which we are able to deliver the content as needed okay so this was basic of containers now let me explain that how aws allows you to run these container there are different services and that sometimes confuses people so i would talk about how containers on aws work and let's move forward and discuss all these components okay so we want to run containers on aws so what type of services we have so before i talk about service let me talk about categories now container is still a software it is still a image so what i need i need a storage space where i could keep these container images so containers runtime or container information we package it into something called a container image so what we would be doing we would be having a image storage that service is required because we want to keep our operating our container images there so we would have a image storage and second thing we would have would be a compute tier because it is just an image i need to run it and that running is a compute like you have a word file stored in your disk and if you have to edit that word file you have to open it into a ms word program so it loads from that disk to your memory and then you start leveraging that particular word file similarly you would need a location to store your images and you would need a place to run these images so that it can connect to network it could perform different operations so that's what we are expecting to do in this particular case okay Container share the OS kernel only when instance of an OS can run many isolated container. Exactly. Does it mean container mounted on a single OS can be extended to another OS? Not like that, Santhil. So what you do, you take an image. From one image, you could launch hundred containers if you want. Now you could take that image to second host and launch another container. Or if it is a shared environment from one image, you could launch hundreds of containers on different different hosts. Should not be a problem. But yes, you would be needing a image to get started. Extend. I don't understand the word. Can't be extended to another OS. Means see. when you create a container you have to say this is a container for linux or this is a container for windows it won't work cross like that 
because the hooks into operating system of windows and hooks into operating system of linux would be different so a container packaged for windows won't work on linux a linux packaged container won't work on windows but you could package the same content in two format and then run it on windows or windows or linux should not be a problem all right good let's move forward so image storage the service we offer in aws is called elastic container service so elastic container service is the mechanism by which i am storing my images so it stores obviously this is storage so we may need to encrypt it and manage container images this is where i could also do version control and the service we offer for that is called elastic container registry ecr is the short form ecr is a place where i would create my container images upload it and then it could be consumed by other consumer within my account or i could share if i want to so those options are there that is called elastic container registry it is a storage for my container images now some keyword here so that you understand when i will show you some demos one thing is here is called repository so you may have a repository for linux based tools another repository for hr system another thing for something else so repository is the location on which these images will be grouped together and think like a s3 bucket where you keep object here in ecr we go ahead and put repositories and that repository would then have your container images on that ecr is like docker hub exactly it is like docker hub docker hub is a public one this one is private and it is within your environment so yes that is true it is similar a place to keep your images so in ecr you would keep your images images would be clubbed together into form of a repository and inside those there would be container images which you could maintain so this is a storage now i want to run these compute the, sorry run these containers and to run anything i would need cpu memory disk and network connection so what we are doing here we are utilizing a ec2 hosted service option this is one approach or we allow you to run container into serverless fashion also serverless what you say in this case hey this is my container image i want to run it with this much of cpu and memory and please run it for me i don't care how you run it that service we offer in a serverless fashion is called AWS Fargate. So in Fargate, you just submit your details of what you actually need and we would run that thing for you. You do not have to worry about anything of CPU, memory, disk. You just tell what you need and we would provide you that much information and resources so your container image could run there. So that is a serverless way of running Fargate as a service. So serverless service, serverless containers can be run on AWS Fargate. It runs container without managing the server. If you do not want to use Fargate for whatever reason, maybe there are some limitation, maybe you need better host control, maybe you want to install some third party software like Prometheus on your cluster for maintenance. So the second approach we offer here in middle is EC2 hosted. You could take bunch of EC2 machine, install the required component on those bunch of machines and then you are able to run your own containers on top of it so you run container with server level control you install docker you install the runtime of your choice and you could run these servers and maintain it on your own if one of the ec2 fails you would very verify its health and start it if any of them has malfunctioned you would be then fixing that problem so that is one approach where i take bunch of ec2 configure them to run my cluster and then i keep moving forward that is one approach but then there are a lot of heavy lifting of updating those runtime then ensuring security on that ensuring auto scaling of that so you have to put a lot of effort so we give you a service called elastic container service or call ecs in this ecs what we are providing you we are providing a ready to use cluster kind of a stuff so you don't have to worry about which operating system to use you don't have to tell which version of patches to deploy we would give you an image which is ready to use for container and that you could deploy on ec2 and i'll show you demo if the time permits so that is called my ec2 sorry ecs elastic container service and we love this word elastic in aws elastic here represent flexibility to expand or shrink based on the load which is coming up so we will be utilizing elastic container services here through which you could run the service so run container using fully managed container orchestration now what is orchestration orchestration is a mechanism by which i run containers and i maintain them on longer run so what if if my one of the container failed 
who would take care of its health who would launch another container to replace it what if if i have to add 100 containers and i have 50 server which container would be placed on which server which server has capacity to run this container how if a server fails which container has to be restarted so that is all done by orchestration service so what ecs is ecs is your orchestration service and if you are a kubernetes shop or if you want to use kubernetes so we give you a managed service also for that so that is called eks concept is same they are all powered by ec2 at the back end the difference is in case of ecs and eks that is being managed or orchestrated for you so these ecs and eks these are basically container orchestration services at the back end everyone is using ec2 to run their services all right so hopefully this one is clear that what is that what is about cost comparison it's a little longer topic we do not have time today but yes there are different concept related to ecs and eks you pay for some nodes in that eks but yes you could check pricing page where you could get and try that what is the difference between ecs and Fargit? there is approach difference in ecs i will show you demo if we get time in ecs you have those ec2 machines maintained by you in Fargate, AWS maintains it and they are running there. That's all. So you do not have to worry about those things in this particular case, right? Okay. Okay, let's move forward and let's see what is happening here, what I could do from that. So EC2 instances versus container. Now, I don't want to talk about container purely from the technical perspective, but let me give you a comparison so that you could relate to how these containers would be working. Now, I, if I go to this, I won't have time for a demo, but I will still be trying to giving you an idea that how all these things work and maybe some other time if we have some more, uh, we could have some liberty of time, I'll show you demo. So let me go ahead and talk about how you use ec2 and how you could use some concept of that ec2 also to run your container let me explain that thing how it actually works now what happens here that you would need a ami to start a ec2 machine isn't it we already know that ecs ec2 machine requires an ami and this ami is stored into s3 not directly you see the bucket but the back end powering mechanism to store your ami is amazon s3 so you need an image image has to be stored somewhere once this image is available that image can be used to power x instances for you so you could take that ami and from that you could run an instance image is just an operating system and to run an instance you still have to say which ami to use what cpu memory would be working which role i am going to assign to it what network or storage i am to utilize it only when i add this additional information with the ami that becomes an instance but having one instance would be not sufficient on longer run. What if, if it fails? So what you will probably do on longer run, you would put those instances into auto scaling group, right? And in this auto scaling group, you define how many instances you need, what is the minimum and maximum criteria, what health check to perform, how the deployment would happen. All this information is stored inside your auto scaling group. And once you have defined what auto scaling group, then what you would, be needing you would be needing an execution environment a physical or virtual server where this would be running so for this execution environment what we offer we offer for ec2 a component called nitro system it is an approach of hardware and software on this you can then launch your auto scaling group could be multiple auto scaling group can be launched and maybe you need one single endpoint for them so you would have a load balancer which will be front ending this auto scaling group and then your users would be connecting to that so that is how a traditional ec2 machine works you take a ami you associate additional information to make it an instance you put those multiple instances into a group called auto scaling group and that group would be running on some hardware software combination nitro system and you would front end it with a elb so your users could connect to it so that's how we move forward and apply a ec2 machine to auto scaling group let me take the similar example and explain to you that how you deploy a container using amazon ecs now i would use some keywords here so pay attention to those keywords what is a task what is a service i would try to explain them by taking example of your ec2 machines so like ami we would need a container image to get started 
what is nitro system sudhakar i would say check our previous version video previous version videos of ec2 and you would get to know what eks what nitro system is so container images are needed to run and that container image instead of storing into s3 i am storing it into amazon ecr so i am trying to compare similar concept to how we run these now these container images are like just a definition it is just kind of a text file what i would be doing here i would be saying hey i want to put them into a task so this is a technical keyword here when i want to run something on ecs we call it a task and a task would have what a task would say which image to use a task would say how much cpu and memory is required and a task would say what network or storage components are required for it so this information is packaged together into task you could quickly see and compare the task is in a way instance i am just comparing for understanding not technically but they i have the similar kind of things which you would need for an instance cpu memory then your role and network storage that is all we put together into a task done task is one task one container or maybe multiple container in that what if it fails so these tasks are grouped together into something called a service what is a service service is a group of task we define again similar thing minimum task maximum number of task we define which health check to verify their health we perform deployment on that so that all is running in the similar format so they are in a way auto scaling group and now these services has to run because it is just a definition so what i have to do now i have to execute it and for that execution the execution environment which i would have would be a ecs cluster so once i have created a service definition that service can be put together to run on a ecs cluster so maybe i would run my service on a ecs cluster or i could say i would like to run it on a fargate so we could run this service on the fargate and then that service would be running and it would have connectivity networking database connectivity whatever you want and then probably you would again front end with with a load balancer and that's how your users would be connecting to it so as you could see it's not very different only the thing is we don't call them instances we call them task we don't call them auto scaling group and we just call them services and that's how we are running our container based services here all right so hope this thing is clear i try to keep it as simple as possible to define what is service what is a task is a service step mandatory venkat asking answer is no see can you launch a ec2 machine without a auto scaling group exactly you can launch it no problem at all on that so you could still launch a task but again if the task fails you have to take care of its health you have to verify it you have to check whether it is running or not and recreate the task if it fails but if you put it into service service would take care of its availability would ensure that they are spread across multiple host in multiple az so it would give you additional layer of uh, manage management and uh, availability but task can individually also run should not be a problem at all okay so step of service is not mandatory but highly recommended because only services can have load balancers associated right all right let's move forward now one more thing which people use let me go ahead and talk about that is eks in eks concepts remain the same so if you got auto scaling right you would understand eks and understand ecs also let's go ahead and talk about that what we are doing here we will take the same approach we have ecr we have task we have service let me show how our containers in eks will run so see this if you compare again images images are still in ecr but instead of calling these thing task in my amazon eks world elastic kubernetes service world we call them pod so what we are doing we are not calling them task but we call them pod what a pod is again a container image put together with cpu memory role and network that is what i would be calling a pod and then pod are put together into a group that is called my deployment so that is what deployment is in a kubernetes world so that's how your deployment would work and again you would need a cluster to run it that is your execution environment so pod is a group sorry pod is one container or more put together into deployment and then for execution i may say hey i would run it into eks cluster and i would move forward from them or i could have said i would be doing a deployment or i could doing that into a service so in 
ECS EKS world, the service definition is little different. Service is when you have a deployment front-ended by a load balancer that is called a service. And that's how we should be able to utilize all these things. So it is similar, yes, exactly. Concept are same, but there is a difference on the wording and difference how these things are created. In Kubernetes, they are called pod and deployment. And then combination of deployment with your load balancer is called a service. Or you could run a service directly on a fire gate it is purely up to you how you utilize and which one to work and how with all these things work so that was a quick comparison hopefully you got an idea how containers are how aws services help you and if we get time i would be happy to show you demo some other some other session but hopefully this one is clear now what i'll also do i would be putting these information these are called service summary card which i have created so i would be creating these i have created these card for all these services and that's what my book is all about so i would be sharing these individual cards on the besa resources page in a day or two so you could get this pdf in a single screen talk about what to use when to use what cost is about ecr ecs and eks and i would include fargate also so all these common things would be available to you right so hopefully everyone is clear we can see a lot of questions but there is limited time and in interest of time i would stop now and we will have a quick five minute break and once we return from break i would ask jamila to help us out with some of the behavioral track if you have follow-up questions please wait for a minute let us also take some breath and let's drink some water and we will be with you to answer your question please have five minute break and we would start again and Afterwards, also you could uh, you could put all these things into LinkedIn and ask us question. If you feel something important and learn something new, share it on LinkedIn so other people also know about this program and they also get benefited. So enjoy your break. Talk to you in five minutes. Thank you. All right, welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone is back. If you are back, let me know in the chat what was the last book you have read. Anyone? What was the last book you have read? And then I'll hand it over to Jamila and she would recommend some great books. Thanks Jamila for your time. And I'll make you presenter. I'll go to your slide and we'll get started. Let's check what answers we are getting. I want to also get some inspiration on what books people are reading. I like comics too, let me admit. So anyone recommending Marvel comics, I would be happy to learn more on that. Atomic Thank hobbies. Thank you, Ashish. And I, I think we also need to kind of ask um, people what type of books we mean. I mean, see, some yeah. people are writing solutions, architect handbooks, um, atomic habit, um, like all sorts of books, right? So I, I'll give you my book? answer, Jamila. Go on. I have two types of books. One book which I want to read, and one I read when I want to sleep. So, so that book, which I, I, I'm not getting asleep, I will pick up something like a history, complicated one, and obviously in 10 minutes, I am gone. But yeah, when I'm interested, then I don't read books on the bed because it's not a good place specifically for me. So that's how I move forward with that. All right, so a lot of answers are coming up. Thank you. Thanks for that. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Limitless, Intensity, Pep in the Secret. Mark Twain, if you know Mark Twain, which one Mark Twain's? Mark Twain is a famous author. Yeah, mm -hmm. I read some of his books in my master's degree in English. So yeah, Mark Twain, I read about him. You need some books to read. Okay, so let me share uh, the screen Jamila wants to talk and I'll mm -hmm. let her handle and I'll be off camera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. Um, and thank you, everyone, um, for joining our um, sessions today. Um, again, um, I'm Jamila. Uh, most of you probably already know me. Um, and and uh, today I will be talking about um, which books to read. It's, it's not going to be um, about like generic books. It will be mainly um, focused on writing. So at in Amazon, in AWS, we write a lot. So regardless of um, you are in technical role, non-technical role, um, management position, um, junior position, it doesn't matter, you write a lot. And it is very important um, because um, it helps you grow um, regardless of your level, regardless of your seniority, and it helps to clarify um, your um, 
thoughts and what you actually want to do. And especially what I really like uh, in Amazon, um, that um, if you have an idea, for example, or if, if you are working on something, um, you can come up and you will need to write a one pager. So basically all your ideas or all your thoughts you need to compress it to one pager and you need to specifically highlight uh, what is the benefit of your idea or what is the benefit of whatever you, you are trying to achieve. It's similar with blog post writing. It's similar with um, having a new idea about the about the process or internal things or might be even external. And so one pager um, is important. And how to write it and how to start actually writing is, um, at first I was thinking it's quite easy. Well, the main thing you have, you have your thoughts, you have your ideas, just go and, and start writing, right? It's as simple as it gets, but apparently not. And I faced that when I started to, when I started my, um, blog post writing um, in AWS, in AWS block channel. Um, it, I don't want to say it was difficult, but it was challenging for me because I was, I always looked at um, writing as a, like it's easy, right? <laughs> just, just go and write. But it wasn't the case because especially if you're writing a technical blog post and if, if you want to specify all the technical details, it might get complicated because you will go down very deep and you will you will just basically write that okay what this code is doing that's it but any other people who will be reading your blog post or your um solution will be thinking that it is complicated it is not what it's meant to be and and it will um the communication writing communication will get broken in the middle and that's why i thought um i thought it will be good for people also to understand the um, necessity of learning um, how to write, um, how to write for technical people, how to simplify their technical mindset and um, the explanation of technical complexity. Um, and for that, of course, you can, you can, you can go, go um, and find different resources, right? You can go ahead to AWS um, documentations or any other um, documentations, just start reading it and understanding um, the structure. Uh, for example, you can go ahead and, and look at the blog post um, from AWS, like let's see, um, like the technical solution, and you can start analyzing um, the structure, like the introduction, the solution overview, and how the authors actually summarizing it, what they're highlighting, what is the structure, and what is the um, how to say, what is the like the main purpose of the blog post, and then you can start um, experimenting for yourself. Like if you're preparing for the interview and you have, um, let's say, a um, couple of questions that you are thinking you might get asked, those questions take your answer. Um, in star format that we already covered in our previous sessions, um, just um, take your um, take your answer in star format and try to um, write it write it down. Try to write it down in a structured way, and then try to show it to your mentor, to your friend. Um, it can be even to your partner who is out of the literature, for example, and just say, "Hey, can you read and tell me what you think?" Because when we're saying it. Um, it's easy for us because we can understand the emotions, we can understand the uh, face expression, and we can understand that, okay, is it clear enough for that person or not? But when you are writing, actually, it's quite difficult. You don't get it um, that sense. You can show your partner, you can just um, brainstorm with your friends, like read it, like five, give it five minutes. If that person is able to read in, in within five minutes your one pager, your idea, your technical implementation that you did, um, then you did a great job, probably. And then you ask them to tell you what, what you meant in, in your writing. If it's exactly one-on-one, then great, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing it, and maybe you will extend um, your knowledge to writing blog posts and, and publishing maybe on, on different channels like medium.com. I'm reading lots of um, uh, blog post technical blog post from medium.com as well so you can be um you can stretch your um skills on that dimension as well um i think i started to talk a lot <laughs> so um ashish i will ask you to share the uh, slide and i will um start actually um 
I will start actually, yeah, um, talking about the books that I think um, will be beneficial for you to start. Um, that's better, yeah, to start actually, um, kind of start from one point to read books about writing um, and then start to kind of look at your writing and um, reconsider um, your um, kind of story and your writing um, abilities as well. And before I actually start talking about the books, I see the comments on, on, on my screen and I see um, someone um, posted their, um, my blog post. So thank you very much. Um, then cut career 001. Thank you very much for posting my blog post. Yes, that's exactly the blog post I was talking about. Um, cool. Um, so let me just start talking about the books. Yeah, so the first book you see on the screen, um, Save the Cat. So it's essentially, and I divided the books um, based on the categories. So the category for, for the first one is, um, as you see, primarily um, focuses on structure and formula. So um, as I said, when you have your ideas, especially you are deeply technical or you're not technical, but trying to get technical and you're starting to talk about your technical things that you've done, and your idea might get really complicated and you might lose the structure. So this book can help you. It's like basics in the college. It helps you to build up um, your stories and focuses on formula and structure, how to start, um, what to focus, etc. cetera. It, it, these books are not necessarily for technical writing, but I believe if you know, if you start um, exercising on just regular uh, structure, um, it will help you with uh, technical writing as well. Um, then the second one, um, uh, story engineering, is like a master class in storytelling and novel writing. So it focuses deeply on, this, on um, some core elements or competencies of successful storytelling. I think this is also important because when you are interviewing, no matter which companies, bigger, smaller startups, um, it is important that you know um, how to tell your story and how you can um, you can deliver your story that the people who are listening will believe you. And um, mainly some, sometimes when we're interviewing the candidates, yes, they tell you the story. Yes, they tell you the, the important things they did, but sometimes it's not convincing enough or maybe they're lacking um, the structure or the storyline and they are not able to deliver it um, in, in the manner that other person on the other side of the screen will um, understand the way that they want to be understood. Um, so story engineering book will be heavily um, focusing on structure. So this is something that you really, um, if you really want to understand and learn how to structure your stories, your writing, um, then story engineering book will um, fit you. And the next book is about cash advertising. Um, so as if you want to be a blogger, successful blogger, um, I think um, you might find it really helpful um, because most bloggers, um, it, it has the most modern approach and best um, summary of the key points covered in the fundamental copywriting books. So um, let's face it. Um, successful blogging in persuasive um, writing in another suit of um, kind of clothes. So it doesn't matter if you want to make money from your blog or not. Uh, if you're writing just a simple LinkedIn blog post, you want, if you're writing, if you are putting your energy and time, you do want it to be catchy, to, um, to get some attention maybe that you want to get or some reactions from your audience. Um, so this um, book, which is also um, relying on structure and using um, the mechanics of language will help you to, um, to achieve your end goal. And the last but not least, uh, my uh, dearest colleague James, who will be um, who will be live um, shortly, um, who recommended me um, uh, to read this book about uh, Stephen King on writing. So even if you never read any King's um, gory th um, thrillers, this book um, is a must read. So James told me that. I've got from other colleagues that hey, this is a must read book. So um, this is definitely the highlight of um, the books. Um, so people, are, people even were telling me that 
um, if you read it, great, then you have to re-read re it at least once a year. So I will be honest, I haven't read it, um, but um, since all my colleagues around, including James, recommended me to read this book, it's a must read, then I will be reading. So it's like very much a memoir. So the, um, um, the description that I read, um, it's very much like a memoir. Uh, King uses stories of his wild childhood to illustrate the making um, of writer. So besides memorable stories, um, you'll get insight into structure key takeaways on um, mechanics and, and his position on what's important to the writing craft and to writers. You have to get um, peer inside his head and see how his mind formulates those ideas and craft, crafts unworldly um, plots. So you will be both um, um, old and inspired to suddenly see uh, story elements all around you. Um, with that being said, um, this is something um, definitely worth reading, um, and I will be reading too. And um, if you already read any of these books on the on this slide, um, please type it in the um, in the comment section so I can see um, who read it and potentially see your comments. If you haven't, um, please pick one of these books that you think will be beneficial for you um, and maybe let's create a challenge, right? Feel free to take a screenshot, um, shoot it on the link on LinkedIn and tag me and say, okay, I'm, I'm starting a challenge within 30 days. I will read this and that and I will share my uh, feedback or thoughts, etc. It's all possible, right? And maybe I, you will challenge even me to start actually reading uh, Stephen King on writing as well. So let's keep it fun, um, entertaining, and um, also helpful by learning new things um, all together. So this was um, about me and my opinion around um, writing and some of the books, again, um, my personal preferences. It doesn't mean you any other books are worse or better. It's entirely up to you. You can use any different methods to learn, but I thought it is worth mentioning to talk about writing and technical writing um, for you, for your career development. Um, with that being said, I will be handing over to my colleague, um, James, who will be um, awesomely speaking about um, serverless and um, helping us to understand more, um, more about the architecture and all the details about serverless. Thank you very much for listening to me, um, for joining, and I see some of the People were welcoming me. Thank you. It was me. And thank you, James, for joining. Finally, I can hand yeah. over officially. <laughs> yeah. It's a rush down here. Um, yeah, it's an awesome book, that Stephen King one. Um, it's just general writing, mm -hmm. general writing skill, because obviously Stephen King's such a such an awesome mm -hmm. writer. Um, it's a awesome. really, really you read it, right? Yes, I have. Um, yeah, it's good. It's good. Now I'm jealous. Somewhere if somebody can spot it, then you, you there's no prizes. Mm. Sorry, I've not got any prizes, unfortunately. But. <laughs> Nice, nice. Cool. Um, good luck with your session and um, yeah, see you around. Awesome. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever, wherever you are. Um, today's session, I am going to be talking to you about um, event-driven architecture. So although this isn't a serverless service as such, it's a really important architecture pattern for um, building serverless applications. Um, I'm not sure if my slides have appeared yet or my screen sharing. Um, it doesn't look like it is on Twitch. Ashish, can you grab that if possible? Um, awesome, there they are. Um, okay, cool. So um, just a quick, a quick yes or no in the chat, if possible. Um, who has heard of the term event-driven architecture outside of me rambling on it, on about it on in, on LinkedIn, of course. Has anyone heard the term or knows what the term means? Oh, yeah, a few yeses flying in, perfect. Yeah, used AWS EventBridge, awesome. We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. Okay, cool, lots of people heard of it. Yeah, so service oriented architecture is slightly different actually, um, and I will get into why um, when we get into this. So, Awesome. So yeah, as we talked about in the first session last week, um, serverless applications tend to be lots of small 
pieces that are loosely joined together. And it's that that joining of things together is where event-driven architectures become really powerful. But before we talk about the technical, whenever I talk about event-driven architecture, I actually like to talk about human biology. And this will make sense in a second, hopefully. Um, so it's estimated that our brains, our human brains, process 11 billion bits of information per second. Now that's a lot of data for our brains to be processing. And if you think about our brains, our brains are just event consumers. Our brains are taking in events and they're making decisions based on what these events contain. If I, if I touch my desk in front of me, my brain chooses not to do anything. It chooses not to react to me touching my desk. But if I was to go into my kitchen and to touch my stove, with my stove turned on, my brain would have a very different reaction to that event. Our, our bodies and our brains are completely reactive. We react to events we receive. We don't waste energy or do things when we don't actually need to. And if we take that a level higher, in fact, we, we navigate the world in events. If you think about when you choose to do things in your day to day life, something will happen that will choose make you then choose to go and do something else. Maybe you receive an email that forces you to then go and do something for a customer. We are event driven fundamentally as humans. So when we can start to apply some of these event driven ways of thinking, when we talk about computer systems, as well as all the wonderful technical benefits that come along with that, it also fundamentally aligns with how we as humans navigate the world. And that has a really awesome benefit when you're building systems and building applications, because these, these systems, the way they run are aligned with how we as humans navigate the world. Okay. So let's just, let's just set the scene a little bit now. Um, a close second to the things I love to talk about um, event driven architectures is pizza. If I can find a way to get pizza into any kind of talk, it's a big win, if you ask me. I apologise, by the way, for anyone who's close to dinner time or a meal. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I can't send pizza your way, unfortunately. Um, so what I want you all to do is just to close your eyes for a second. And I can't check that you're doing this because you're not in front of me. But close your eyes for a second. And just imagine you've walked into your favourite pizza takeout. Imagine you walk up to the counter and then you place your order. Okay. And then after you've placed your order, things start to happen in the background. But the things that you don't you don't care about, you don't need to react to. You know, you might watch the, the base get rolled. You might um, you might see it get baked. You might see it get boxed. And at the point it gets boxed, that's where you then step forward and get to take your pizza. Now, if we think about this, this, this pizza making process can be easily changed. It can easily be extended. We can really easily start to change the workflow, change parts of the business. And it's incredibly observable. I can stand there behind the counter and actually watch my pizza being made. That's, that's incredibly powerful. And like I said, that's how we navigate the world. And now, again, if we think about our systems in this way, our applications in this way, the same the same rules kind of apply. If it's these events that are driving your applications and you need to make a change to a system, or you need to add some additional functionality or an additional feature, or maybe you need to handle part of the system going down, because all of this is event driven, events are the first class citizens of your systems that becomes really powerful. And if you couple that with Lambda that we talked about last week, if you remember, Lambda is completely event driven. That's Lambda's superpower. And you only pay for Lambda when it's being used. So if there's no events flowing around the system, Lambda's just sat there waiting for something to happen. It's not costing you anything, it's efficient. Okay, enough about pizza and human biology. Let's start talking about some technical stuff. Why do we need an event driven? architecture and there is some overlap here with some of the things we talked about last week when it comes to serverless computing and why we need lambda 
Um, it's important to know that serverless doesn't equal event-driven architecture. They're two completely separate things. They just happen to play really nicely together. You can build an event-driven system on EC2 or containers, as Ashish was talking about earlier. That is possible. And you'll remember this slide from last week. Um, and this, this applies equally as much to why we need an event-driven system. These fallacies of distributed computing. Um, so someone mentioned service-oriented service, service -oriented architecture in the chat. A service-oriented architecture is typically more point-to-point. -point. So this system talks to this system, talks to this service, talks to this service, talks to this service. The difference comes with an event-driven architecture when each of these services are just publishing events. They're just saying, hey, this thing happened. Does anybody care about it? And these other systems can choose to react as and when they need to. And why this is this is incredibly powerful when we talk about distributed computing is because then we're not reliant on the network. We're not we're not reliant on the, the, the network going down, our services being online, because all we're interested in is just notifying other people that things have happened. So it helps to get around some of these challenges around distributed computing. It also gets around some of the challenges with coupling. As we, again, talking about service-oriented architecture, this is typical of a service-oriented architecture. Service A talks to service B, hence the service-oriented part. The services are the, the first-class citizens of your application. Now, if one of these services goes down, if service B goes down in this situation, what happens to service A? What, what, how, how does service A react to that? Does it retry, but then how long does it retry for? Whereas with an event, if we, if we look at the same level of coupling with an event-driven system, service A would just publish an event and service B might choose to do something that would later. If service B was offline, it might still store that event somewhere and then come back later and pick up and carry on processing where it left off. So it's a, it's a fundamental, it's, it's a shift in how you think about your systems rather than services being the kind of the kind of uh, first class citizen. You're making these events the first class citizen in your system. Okay, this is a really this is a um, really great quote by a guy called Gregor Hope. And talking of books, actually, if I just pick my laptop up a second, this is a really awesome book from a technical perspective. It's called Enterprise Integration Patterns um, by a gentleman called Jack Gregor Hope, and it talks through the different ways you can integrate parts of your system together. And one of the quotes in the book is this the appropriate level of coupling depends on the level of control you have over the endpoints and what that means is that if you're building a system where maybe your team owns three or four services you're developing all them services together then coupling them services together in a more service oriented architecture isn't as big of a risk because your team owns the SLAs of that system, your team owns the uptime, the release cycles, how often you make changes. So coupling is a little bit easier. Whereas if you're integrating with some, you know, other system that some other team that may be in the same company, maybe a third party, maybe they're in a different part of the, the world, then you want to try and reduce that coupling as much as possible because you have no control over what that other system is going to do. You can't control when they're online. You can't control um, when they change things, if they change their schema. So you want to try and reduce that coupling as much as possible. And that's where we start thinking more asynchronously. So that service-oriented architecture is very synchronous, as you can see on the left. The client calls service A, which calls service B. And that may go to like C, D, E, F. There might be a whole bunch of services in that chain. If any one of them services goes down, that can cause a cascading failure across the rest of your system that needs to be dealt with. Whereas if we start thinking more asynchronously, a client would call service A and maybe publish an event and say, this thing's happened. Other services can subscribe to that event. I've noticed there's a question about publish, subscribe. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is a key component of um, event-driven architecture. Client calls service A, does some work, publishes an event, returns to the client. 
Now, that's not to say there are challenges with event-driven architecture and challenges um, with things fail. And of course, service B can still fail and that needs to be considered and thought about. But you're reducing that risk of a single failure somewhere, just taking whole swathes of the rest of your system offline. Okay, so what actually is an event-driven architecture? We've just discussed the why, but what what is it? What actually is it? Well, it, fundamentally, an event-driven architecture is, is producers publish events and consumers subscribe to events. It's, it's almost as simple as that. But to kind of talk about that, let's actually define what an event is. So an event is simply a change in state, a signal that there's been a change in state in a system. Something's happened, something's changed. Events always happen, have always happened in the past. There are things that have happened and they're completely immutable. They can't be changed. So you see here, pizza baked, that's happened. That pizza is baked, that is done. A really good analogy I heard from one of my colleagues at AWS on this is if I go, if I go behind me now and turn on my light switch, that's a light turned on event. I can't unturn on a light. It's immutable. I can't change it. The light's on now. The only way I can change it is to take a second action, which will produce another event, a light turned off event. But again, I can't unturn off a light. I can't change that. It's happened. It's done. I can't change it. So that is an event. There's a change in state in a system. It happened in the past and it can't be changed. It's fact. And when you're building event-driven systems, when I say events are first-class citizens, I mean business events. So not things like EC2 instance started or your Kubernetes cluster scales. Like this. They're very technical, very infrastructure things. These are business events. They're things that make sense within the domain of your business. So if we think about our pizza restaurant, we might have some events like you can see on screen there. The order was created, the pizza was baked, we received a payment. One of the other really great benefits about event-driven architecture is it, it really simplifies the communication between technical people and business people. So if you're, if you're an architect and you're maybe talking about, let's say your system is service oriented and you go to talk to the business people, the people who actually drive the features and the functionality, well, you're talking about order services and payment services and, and you know, fulfillment services, kitchen services. These aren't terms that really make sense to um, business people. But if I'm going to a business person in my business saying, right, what should happen when an order gets created? What should happen when an order gets dispatched? What should happen off the back of that? It allows you to have these really valuable conversations with non-technical people. And remember, we're all event-driven. We're all humans. We're all driven by events. So as well as the making sense, it's fundamentally aligned with how we as humans navigate the world. And the final thing about events is that events are observable. They're not, they're not directed so an event wouldn't work in this scenario where I wouldn't send an event to say, to the notification system to say, please notify the user their pizza has been dispatched. That's not how events work. An event driven architecture is more around the order service would say a customer order has been dispatched. And then any interesting parties may then consume that event. So the sales service will add it to the sales report. The fulfillment service in this instance doesn't actually occur, doesn't react. It doesn't do anything with that event. It just leaves it and ignores it completely. So events are observable. Now, there are a way that there are different types of messages within event-driven systems, and you can create directed, uh, more command-based things in event-driven architectures. We're going to get into messaging in a couple of weeks' time. But no, fundamentally, in an event-driven system, events are observable. Okay, so how do we actually build event-driven architectures on AWS? And I'm going to introduce a couple of services um, in the next five or 10 minutes or so. It will be quite high level at this point. I'm going to dive into each of them individually over the course of um, the next six weeks or so because they are so important to event-driven architectures. Um, so let's think about this in a sense of a, a workflow in our pizza restaurant. So let's say an order comes in. 
something needs to within our ordering system something needs to orchestrate this workflow because this is a business workflow that's going on now something needs to kind of organize all these things that need to happen so our orchestration system needs to check if there's stock and if there's stock for our our pizza uh, it needs to check if there's anyone to deliver the pizza of course we need someone to bring that pizza to me and if there's delivery drivers available then we can actually confirm the order this is typical of a business workflow and this business workflow sits within our order service. So we're not communicating with lots of other things just yet. We're thinking about the workflow within a given service. I said the word workflow a couple of times now. The observant amongst you may now be realising that I'm about to talk about step functions. So step functions is by far my favorite aws service it is really really quite incredible um step functions is in its rawest form just a workflow engine it allows you to build workflows your workflows can have individual steps and you could pass um, input into your workflow and that input will be passed from step to step to step and you can use that input and transform that input to actually perform work within your workflow. You can really easily reuse components with step functions. You can like pull bits out, put bits in, change your business workflow over time. Um, step functions behind the scenes are built in what's called Amazon States language um, or ASL. And ASL is a JSON or YAML based syntax that um that uses to use to define your workflow and if you if you look at asl for the first time especially some complicated asl then it it can actually be quite hard to to work out what's going on it's quite um it can be it can be challenging to to read yes step functions is the same as logic apps in azure similar idea um so ASL can be quite tricky. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a language that you need to learn. But as of last year, the Step Functions team released the Workflow Studio for Step Functions. And this is now my de facto way of going to build Step Functions. It's a drag and drop interface where you can just go in, you can build your workflow, you can drag and drop things, you can create choices and different paths and parallel things that are happening. You can do all that in a really easy to use intuitive workflow studio. Um, the other reason this is really powerful is when I go back to what I was saying about being able to sit down with business people and have conversations with business people, you can actually now sit down with a non-technical person and build this workflow together. They don't need to understand what Lambda is or what SNS is. They, you can still sit there and put your finger on a diagram and kind of work your way through what is happening in this given business workflow. So it's a really powerful way to build out your workflows. And then from here, you can actually export your ASL. You can export that JSON or YAML syntax, and then you can store that in, in version control and deploy that with CloudFormation or, or any infrastructure as code tool. And if you need to make a change to your workflow, you can import that ASL back in the step functions and actually then make your changes in this really nice designer. So you get this really neat workflow builder where you've got all these building blocks that you can use that you can just drag and drop and use as you need to. Talking about integrations, um, with these building blocks that you have to build your workflows, um, historically, Step Functions integrated with 17 AWS services, things like Lambda, EventBridge, DynamoDB. These were all what's called optimized integrations. And these were the kind of building blocks that you had. And if you wanted to do anything more complicated, you'd need Lambda. You'd need to use a Lambda function. But again, as of yes, year, and last, last year, and this is the second reason that Step Functions became my ultimate favorite service is that the, the the team released the SDK integrations. And what this means is that the building blocks you've got within your workflow include almost any AWS service, over 200, 10,000 API calls. There are all services you can call directly from within your workflow. 
that you see, the, the, the building blocks you've got, these Lego blocks you've got now to stick together these workflows include almost anything. AI, ML, translation, um, sentiment analysis, video transcription. You can do all that straight from your business workflows. The final part of step functions I just wanted to touch on really quickly. Um, and like I say, I'm going to do a deep dive. I'm going to do a whole session on step functions in probably in a couple of weeks. But within step functions, you've got these intrinsic functions. And these are things that step functions can do, again, without you needing to use a Lambda function. You can do all this without writing any application code. Things like generating random numbers or generating hashes or adding things together or checking like the length of arrays. You can do all that within your workflow without actually um, using like a Lambda or any custom code. So it's a, I think there was a few questions last week around, do I need to be a developer or do I need to come from a development background to start building really interesting things on serverless and AWS? And the answer is no, not at all. It's helpful. It's a great skill to have, of course, but there's really powerful things you can do in AWS with some of these low code, no code solutions like step functions. So we've got this workflow now. We've got this, we've got this business workflow running our pizza restaurant. We've designed it in step functions. It's great, it's running. Um, but now we need to communicate to another system. And remember when we were talking about coupling and coupling services together, well, we're now integrating with a service that's outside of our control. We're working on the order service over here, but we now we want to integrate with the kitchen. The kitchen is actually going to produce the orders. So how do we do that? How do we communicate between different parts of our system without coupling them together? And someone's kind of stolen my thunder with their, their when I asked about have you used event driven architecture before? Because Amazon EventBridge is, of course, the way to do that, to start to connect together these decoupled parts of your application. It's 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 just an event bus, event bridge, it's a serverless event bus. Um and because it's serverless, it scales based on um, how much you use it. It's highly available, it's distributed, it's fault tolerant, and you only pay for the number of events that you consume. There's a few different parts to step functions. You've got the producers and you've got the consumers. At a producer side, there are over 130 different event sources you can use in AWS. Many AWS services you're already using today, if you're using AWS, are already publishing events to EventBridge without you configuring anything. If you launch an EC2 instance, that will publish an event to EventBridge. Start up an RDS instance, a database, that will publish an event to EventBridge. You don't need to configure that. That just happens without you doing anything. In your account, there'll be an event bus called default. All of these AWS services just publish to this event bus all the time. You can send in events from custom applications, custom events that you write within your application code. And this is, of course, the most useful for us in our pizza restaurant because these events are business events, not technical events. And EventBridge also integrates with things like Salesforce and Datadog and Zendesk, these third parties who can publish events straight into your event bus. The other side of EventBridge is the consumers. Of course, people need to listen to these events. And when you set up a, a, a destination in EventBridge or a target, you set up rules. And rules allow you to filter the events that get delivered to your targets. You can filter on any part of the event payload, um, whether it's the type of event or actually some content within the event. Maybe you've got some special part of your kitchen that only processes events that are worth more than you know, hundred pounds, you could do that in event, but you can get to that level of detail with your filters. And then of course you've got your targets, where can you deliver these events to? And there's over 20 AWS services that you can deliver events to. Uh, the really useful ones, of course, Lambda, you can trigger Lambda functions. You can actually make API requests from within EventBridge to maybe some other APIs. The most powerful one in my mind is of course the integration with step functions. So you can start a business workflow directly from EventBridge without writing any custom integration code. And if you're using that integration, that puts all of the operation of that integration onto AWS. AWS now operate that integration for you. 
serverless, we take on a lot more of that responsibility. And that's where these two things work together really well. So if we just think about this business workflow now from an architectural standpoint, our order processing workflow starts, maybe we check the stock and we reserve uh, ready for delivery. And then we just produce a um, order, uh, order ready event or maybe an order confirmed event, whatever that event might be called. The kitchen service is then listening for that event and it's kicking off its own workflow. And the kitchen workflow will go off and do its thing. It'll produce your pizza, hopefully, to, to the, what you wanted. You get what you wanted on your pizza. It'll then publish another event to say, I don't know, order um, kitchen completed, kitchen finished, whatever. And then this order processing workflow can then continue. It can continue doing its work. Now, this, this gets really powerful if you start to introduce things like queues, and we'll talk about queues um, as part of one of these sessions, but we can now start to control how the kitchen reacts. If the kitchen's getting overloaded, maybe the kitchen's offline, we can still keep receiving these events ready to be processed um, and then just maybe process them at a later date. The final thing I just wanted to touch on for today when we talk about event-driven architecture is around consistency. So there are there are um, trade-offs to doing to building event-driven systems. Things get a bit more difficult to kind of follow around your system because you've got all these loose pieces that are all communicating asynchronously. Um, one of the most important things to kind of understand is around consistency, um, and there's, this is around data consistency. And there's two types of consistency. There's strong consistency and there's eventual consistency. Now, I could give you a really technical ex explanation of both of these, but I'm not going to. The best analogy I've heard for strong consistency and eventual consistency is if you imagine you're stood in your pizza restaurant and you need to pay for your pizza, okay? If you were to get your wallet out or your purse out and you were to take um, some actual cash from your wallet and you were to pass that cash to the person behind the counter to pay for your pizza, that's a strongly consistent action. You know at the point you hand over that cash that that transaction has happened. It's, it's absolutely irrefutable because you can look in your wallet or your purse and the money's not there anymore. And the money's in the, the till or in the, in the register. An eventual consistent way of doing that is if you were to pay with a Visa card or a debit card because that's... Paying with a card is, is is a guarantee that at some point in the future, that money will move. If I was to pay on card in the pizza restaurant and then look at my bank statement on my phone straight away, it's likely that that transaction wouldn't show up straight away. But at some point in the future, that will then appear on my bank statement. And of course, the money will then transfer to the, the pizza restaurant. And that's important in our systems because when you start becoming more asynchronous, because you don't have that guarantee that the, the event's actually been consumed yet, you do need to start thinking about your systems in a different way because you may end up with parts of your system that may not necessarily have, have caught up with the latest um, changes or the latest versions of the data. So that's the last thing I wanted to talk about today. Like I said, this was, this was a kind of an introduction to event-driven architecture. Uh, now that we've covered why we need serverless and some of these architectural patterns from next week, we'll actually dive into some specific AWS services, things like step functions, event bridge, um, SNS, SQS, API gateway. We'll actually start to get into some technical architectural patterns now. But that's all for today. Um, yeah, as always, if you've got any questions, Anything that comes up at any time, reach out on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Um, I love talking about this stuff genuinely. So anything that comes up, please feel free to reach out. Um, it'd be awesome to hear from you. And let me just stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thank you, James. This was interesting. And I can see a lot of comments that people are realizing the value of Viva Driven Architecture and how to use that thing. Yeah, I've just seen one question actually. Eventual consistency involves a possibility of a lag. Yes, that, that a lag is a good way of thinking about it. You know, there may be a delay between one part of your system and another part of your system because that event 
may still be in process. This system might be offline and hasn't received it yet. So yeah, a, a lag is a is a good way of thinking about it. Thank you. Now, thank you everyone for joining this session today. Hope you have learned something new and you have enjoyed the session. If you have any feedback, any comments, let us know. If you have learned something, want to share on LinkedIn, feel free. You could have taken screenshot or you could rewatch the Twitch. It would be available for the week on Twitch again, and then you can watch it later on YouTube. So previously Twitch allowed us to keep stream for 14 days, but now it is seven. So for the next seven days, it would be available on Twitch. And next we would be making it available on YouTube. And hopefully you would have a better uh, recap of all the things we have discussed. And thanks for asking all these questions. It was interesting and it was little overwhelming also for us to answer this question and thanks michelle jamila abhijit for doing all the answering there if something remain unanswered let us know reach out to us on linkedin and we would be happy to answer those questions thank you so much have a good day have a good evening have a good night and we will talk to you next week take care bye everyone have a week